Okay, the recording has started, and this is the January 14th, 2020 uh, Brook Community Meeting, the first uh, community meeting of the new year here. So let's uh, go ahead and get started like we normally do with uh, a look at the milestones and releases right now. Uh, so oh, Travis, thank you for updating this agenda doc uh, this morning. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And so we have, uh, this is a link that we have in the agenda doc, but I wasn't aware myself of any 1.1 stuff, right? Is that, that's a, a old link? So well, I kept that there because uh, I think we need to plan on a 1.1.9 release, uh, maybe next week. Um, there have been, I think, three backports into 1.1 since the .8 release. Um, oh, okay. So they're, in the, they're already in the done column then? Right. They're already done. Uh, okay. uh, so we'll just need the .9 release probably next week. The, I think the latest issue is um, if, if users are on OpenShift 4.2 and they upgrade to 4.3, uh, the CSI driver completely falls over. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the urgent reason for the release. Is that a complicated fix or is it a rather simple issue? Oh, it was a fairly simple fix. Basically, there was some change in permissions of the directories in OpenShift and um, the CSI driver was not uh, a, well, the a sidecar container was not running privileged, but the main container was and the sidecar falls over and it needs to talk to the main container. So the, the fix essentially is just to run the sidecar as privileged. Um, and there was another small change similar to that. But. Have, uh, there haven't been any difficulties with the builds or releases or servicing uh, at all, like while we're doing simultaneous uh, patch releases uh, out of multiple versions, right? A 1.1.x and a 1.2.x. Right, I haven't seen that yet. We just yes. have to skip the promotion step for 1.1. Right, yeah, 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 that's not going to right. the Alpha channel. Right. All right, sounds good. Do, uh, is there an ETA or a, uh, uh, any other um, work that's uh, left for 1.1, do you think? No, not planned. Okay. That I'm aware of. Anybody cool. else know of anything urgent to backboard? Okay. All right, let's take a look at the 1.2 board then. Yep, yep, so we're targeting a 1.2.2 for hopefully maybe tomorrow. Yeah, I was just trying to get this board a bit cleaned up. There are yeah, a few issues in flight that I think we should need to get fixed. Um, some of them are just doc issues like your security disclosure there. It's yeah, not urgent for release, just a doc issue. There's the Ceph CSI version detection that um, Stefan started a couple months back. I just pinged him on the PR to see where we are with that. Um, he's not in this meeting, is he? No. Um, so I'll just wait for his response there. Unless Blaine, you know of any progress there? Uh, I, I don't, I know he's been preparing for uh, a presentation to some of our SEs here. Mm -hmm. So I think he's been focused on that. Right. I don't think that's a, an urgent issue either. It's really making sure we've got a good support matrix for CSI. And then the, in the in progress column, so the first one is the one I'm working with Rohan on to get a fix in for the dot two release. Um, there's an upgrade issue with OSDs and the crush map. How, how it lays out. And then the other ones, wait, the, I think the other two could wait if needed uh, until the, the following patch release. Or, or how about the items that are in the to-do column? Are those ones that we're confident we want to be included in a, in a 1.2 patch or could they be you know pushed to 1.3? minor release or yeah some some of those could be pushed to 1.3 i think mm. i think i left them there because we could consider putting them in 1.2 um are they also on the 1.3 board 
Um, I, I didn't check that. Probably okay. not. I haven't paid enough to. I haven't. Oh, I haven't at least gone through the 1.3 board yet. So stuff probably isn't really being tracked there like it should be. Yet. Yeah, that's fair. And it's, I mean, it sounds like there's a tail for both 1.1 and 1.2. That's more of the focus right now. Yeah. But otherwise, yeah, I think that's good for 1.2. We'll just, you know, get a release out around tomorrow. Um, if there are any other urgent issues to get in, well, let's discuss in probably in the dev channel for Slack or tag them appropriately. And we'll just, yep, we'll go with that. that sounds good. Okay. Uh, so then, um, a, there's an update then on um, Minio as well. Then that uh, that you want to share that, Travis, since you did that. Yep. Um, just looking at our operators and community support, and we really need support um, for the operators we have, and that's been lacking for Minio. So we went ahead and removed it. And there's also uh, you now the Minio project created their own operators separately, so they. And they didn't want to jump on board with this one apparently. So we yep, went ahead and removed it. And that is uh it's only in master, right? That's right. Yeah, I didn't worry about backporting it. Okay. Yep. And I think in general project health, I mean we want community involvement. I think we need to keep pushing or asking for community involvement on others. Like I haven't seen much on NFS or CockroachDB operators lately. Um, so yeah, we, sh we should keep pushing to get that involvement. Yeah, and I think a greater discussion that's probably not uh, in scope right now, but something to think about is, um, that, you know, I, at least the, one of the bigger things for Cockroach was uh, how, you know, we still largely most of the examples, at least, and most of the operators are still using the operator kit. I know that as a dependency, we've brought in some of the controller runtime stuff and some, you know, operator SDK stuff. But uh, that that seems to be a development obstacle still. That it's not, you know, the the main supported way. It's only a couple of controllers and features that are implemented using those newer frameworks for <coughs> for Kubernetes controllers and operators. So that seems to be somewhat of a stumbling block for for adoption, developer adoption still. Yeah, and, and actually one thing I could have added to the notes here is that I, uh, in the last week or so, removed removed our dependency on the operator kit. Like there's no more reference to the operator kit. Um, the, uh, you know, I was looking at, hey, how can we simplify that? Because of just updating the Golang dependencies is a real pain whenever we update our version of Kubernetes client. So I just looked at it and I thought, oh, we're only using like two methods from the operator kit. Let's just bring it into the rook project. And, um, yeah, to set up watches, right? That. Exactly. Um, do we do those? Do we do those directly now, or is there like a, now, a function that's in just in rook, the main right. tree? There's like there's like one function that's in our KDS utils package to watch uh, the CRDs. That's that's about it. What about TPRs? <laughs> TPRs. Yeah, that's the, I mean, the main reason that project existed in the first place was to help yep. us manage TPRs versus CRDs. And that's been gone for a long time. Yep. Long time. Thank God. <laughs> right. So with the removal of operator kit, I think that hopefully makes it easy for operators to move to, you know, if they want operator SDK or whatever, but, uh, or we need to move our own, um, CRD watchers to the controller runtime. Yeah, it would it would be nice to to get you know broad adoption of controller runtime and you know higher higher level features and framework uh, usage there across the entire code base. But that's that's a greater effort and a greater discussion for sure. Exactly. Yep. Um, <clears throat> but at least we don't need to worry about operator kit anymore. Yep. Uh, okay, I'm gonna add another item in here. Okay, uh, so yeah, we can go ahead and move on to the community topics, uh, I believe then. Uh, so the first one is that yeah, in December, 
uh, we wrapped up the security audit with the Trail of, uh, Trail of Bits security firm. Uh, so they spent uh, a two person weeks uh, going through the code base, um, doing static analysis, uh, so dynamic analysis, all sorts of tools there, code reviews, um, runtime stuff that, uh, you know, was looking for uh, security issues and vulnerabilities within the Rook code base. Uh, those are the same folks that did the upstream Kubernetes security audit and review. So they had definitely had some experience in this space and brought that uh, to the table, which was really great to have. The, they published a, um, a report on a uh, full report on all of the potential vulnerabilities found. And uh, I think we want to publish that on like in the main GitHub repo. And so that should happen soon. And uh, all the issues that they found that we want to fix uh, have a security label. So you can uh, easily find those and query those in GitHub and see what those issues are. I think that there was only one that was labeled as a critical vulnerability where when debug logging is turned on, uh, there is a possibility of exposing sensitive information. So I think that's the only critical vulnerability that was uh, identified, and that one has already been fixed, uh, if I recall. Is that right, Travis? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. was that, is that backported, too? That sounds like a good candidate for yes. backport. Yeah, um, I'll have to double check, but I'm, it should have been. Awesome. Great, 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 great. Cool. So yeah, that was a great experience with the Trail of Bits folks. They are smart people, definitely have a good security background experience and mindset, and um, it was really good to work with them. So uh, that was cool. And so part, uh, so the whole security audit was part of the <coughs> Cloud Native Computing Foundation graduation process. So we are getting, uh, 2020 has started and we're getting very serious about the graduation now. Uh, so we have started a shared doc here. Uh, for the graduation to-do items. So all the to-do items that we need to get through are tracked here in this document that is linked to, uh, linked to from the uh, agenda items here. And, um, you know, we will you know, start focusing on these uh, in earnest now um, because we want to target the uh, being done before KubeCon Amsterdam, which is a couple, few months away. Uh, but the big thing here for us uh, that kind of just recently accelerated the time frame a little bit in our minds is that uh, we need to present to SIG Storage first to do due diligence with SIG Storage first. Um, I don't, I don't know how, how long that's been part of the process, but it's a slight surprise for, for me and Travis. Um, so we need to do these items here collect, do the due diligence, you know, the testimonials, uh, security disclosure, like all this sort of things here need to be done before we can present to SIG storage. Uh, and then after that, when they've done their vetting, then we have to also prevent the present to the technical oversight committee. Uh, so that's kind of juggling the logistics of the timing there of having to get on two different schedules uh, in a sequential order. Um, makes it's accelerated the effort on this so we started very hard on it now this week uh and we will continue tracking all the items here in this uh in this to-do list is that a public doc or yeah it's it's shared uh publicly um so yeah anybody who clicks on this link should be able to uh view it and comment on it as well oh, cool. it's not public edit publicly editable but it is publicly com commentable <laughs> i like that's a word sounds good Cool. Uh, Travis, oh yeah, okay, you add, added this item here about the security fix being backported. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I verified it was backported. Cool. Uh, I saw an email uh, from Ihor from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation just this week uh, that the Google Summer of Code uh, idea submission time, uh, time is once again upon us. Uh, seems like that seems like a lot of these deadlines just creep up all of a sudden. <laughs> um, so we've had a great success with Google Summer of Code for the past two years in a row now. Um, so I think that uh, you know, it would be nice to participate in it again because we've gotten some great contributions, some, uh, some great new members of the community, some great projects out of it. So um, you know, we should take a, take, a, take a little think here and see if there are any good fit 
uh, items, work items or features or projects that would be good for a university student that wants to get more into open source and you know, learn more about the root community and ecosystem and start contributing there. It's uh, like a two and a half or almost three month process for them. So they could take on some meaty stuff, but it definitely has, you know, a ramp up period, educational period as well. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's um, you can get a lot of work done, uh, but it's appropriate scoping is, is definitely wise there. So let me, let me know or add on Slack or whatever, uh, if anybody has any uh, interesting ideas or features that they would like to submit for the Google Summer of Code program. And then we could uh, submit that along with the rest of the CNCF's uh, submissions and participate in that program for a third year in a row. Right. And mentors, anyone active in the Rook project should be able to be a mentor, correct? I don't know, they don't have restrictions like on who can be a mentor or whatever. Just if you have a feature that you can mentor somebody on in Rook, then you could be a mentor. Yeah, uh, the, the, mentor, the mentoring for the program does take uh, a non-trivial amount of time uh, because you need to support them and work with them and have regular meetings with, uh, with the um, student as well. Uh, but it is super rewarding. Uh, it's a great experience to have. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, you know, definitely let us know as well. Okay, uh, we can move on to the next item here. Uh, Travis, do you want to speak to this item? Uh, I'll let Sebastian talk to it. Oh, Sebastian, perfect. Do it in French, Sebastian. I'm learning French now, so I'm ready to. French. I'm ready to listen. Are you? In French. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, actually, let's do it in English. Never mind. <laughs> um, so the next item on the list is self OSD change coming in one three. I've I've took a stab at deprecating slash removing the legacy way of bootstrapping OSDs, where we were creating partitions uh, labeled as Rook, as well as removing the ability to bootstrap OSDs on directories. Uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's actually a PR that has two goals. So, so the one is to like, prepare um, for the next generation OSDs to be ready. And with that, we th there is a bunch of code to be removed uh, because a bunch of code has been announced as well where we make usage of more set volume comments. For example, uh, in the old code, the, we had this really tricky way to uh, look at devices using LSBLK uh, populating device info from NSBLK, and then always checking, uh, does this device have a partition and or a file system, or is it a partition or and things like this. So I removed all of that logic. So now we use self volume inventory. The self volume inventory command is capable of testing devices. And then we'll be telling this in a really senior way whether or not a device is available or is a good candidate to become an OSD. So if the device is available, then the comment will simply return true. And if it's not, then it will give us like a, reject, uh, a rejected reason why it's not available. Um, so there is this part, um, which, which is actually extremely helpful uh, when you bootstrap OSDs in a regular way. So um, a lot of code has been removed from the prepare pod. Uh, and the second piece of that change is, is um, bootstrapping OSDs using the new self volume mode. So now self volume has two modes, one with LVM, one that is called raw. And the raw mode is simply consuming the entire block device without, without putting any LVM on top of the device. So it's really like, it's really straightforward. Uh, where block while in DB or all co-located onto the same device. Uh, this is extremely helpful when you do OSDs on PVCs because we have seen many limitations and we have hit uh, so many blockers uh, down the road when implementing OSDs on PVCs because of LVM. 
and the way device are are basically held by LVM. So uh, we we had issues in the past where you you have an OSD that is prepared by LVM, and then it, the, this OSD is actually an EBS volume. You can try to detach that volume, and because the block is still held by LVM, then you can't really detach it. So because of that, you have to go into a different path where you deactivate the VG before stopping the OSD and then you can actually release it. So this, this made the whole process really difficult to maintain and manage in Rook. And this is actually also making use of the Rook binary. And we also realized that when we upgrade Rook, then we deliver a new binary version. And because of the pod spec as a new binary version, then the deployment gets upgraded. So even if nothing actually changed in the deployment object uh, from one root version to another, then all the OECs will be restarted. And that's actually not a good thing. So um, yeah, I guess coming back to what's more concerning for 1.3 is that every single cluster that was like running either using the old legacy Rook OSDs or on directories, then won't be able to operate anymore. As a transition path, we are, I'm, I'm currently working and I'm gonna set a patch like in a minute um, to allow partition support so that we will encourage people to, before they upgrade to 1.3, to add partitions or even drives if they want, but apparently, partitions have come up in the discussion. And even if people don't have extra disks, then they have extra partitions. So um, the idea would be to trash one OSD at a time, if it's a directory based OSD, and then add a partition in the cluster CR. That, that new partition will be picked up and then configured and a new OSD will come out of it. And then Seth would just uh, do the recovery in the background. So. That's our, I guess, limited uh, transition scenario. But it's, uh, I mean, that's the way it is. It's, uh, we know that that's gonna be a really destructive and disruptive upgrade for people not transitioning, but moving forward, that's probably the best way to do it. Uh, a, a way or another, we will have to stop supporting that. And it's, uh, yeah, I think we all feel like it's the right time to do it. So yeah, hence the PR, I guess. And Sebastian, do you uh, do we have any sense of uh, like the percentage of people that would be affected by and have to go through that um, that more manual upgrade path, or is it like a pretty small amount, or we don't really have the telemetry to really have a good uh, sense of that? I don't think we do at this point, and I guess one of the reasons why I'm like we are we're bringing this into the community meeting is actually to bring awareness. Uh, as part of that, we will also like, uh, I think I already sent a message on the Slack channel, but we will do our best, I guess, to, I guess, pass the message on Slack uh, via GitHub issues or even tweet about it, I don't know, so that people uh, people are aware of what's gonna happen in 1.3. I actually think like we have a lot of followers on Twitter, so uh, if we create a, an issue, that really summarize what's going to happen and how you should be transitioning from one two to one three, uh, and point that issue on Twitter or something similar. Then uh, we will get a lot of attention, I guess. And uh, and just just to help me understand a little bit further, that not everyone would be affected by this, right? Like this is a subset no, no, no. of people that are using legacy, like unsupported That's right. things. Yeah. Like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, like, if we do some write up about it then having a section that's very clearly like how to tell if you are affected is, is really useful oh, yeah. for those types of messaging. So people could be like, oh, that's not me. And then they can stop worrying very quickly. That's right, yeah. And also like, uh, also just to give an extra reason why we started doing this work is that uh, we like Travis, Travis implemented the set volume support like more than a year ago. So this, this should have also like even more time to people to transition to use like to use sub volume. So yeah, it's about time, I guess. Yeah, we've been maintaining that old code for a long time. So it's it's about time to remove it. Hmm. Yep. Cool. Agreed. Thank you for yeah, the uh, explanation, Sebastian.
Yeah. yeah. We just need to get the word out and be clear about transitioning and upgrading. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think a, a write up of that an issue that's very, very clear, very easy to understand, like communicates like the, you know, strong reasoning for it and all that sort of stuff would be really helpful. And then we can, we can definitely, we can treat that. And Travis, you have uh, the Twitter credentials, the account credentials now, right? Yep. Right. Can we also like, um, I guess, perhaps writing a blog post for this would be nice. And then we can tweet it yeah. so that we have like, okay, this is what's going to happen as a blog post. Um, because that's what blog posts are made for, right? We don't we don't only have to do like let's say press releases <laughs> with the blog. Right. We can also like discuss technical subject and also like um, upgrades and transitions like that are probably a good place. Yeah, yeah, and, and pictures yeah. too. <laughs> and pictures too, right? Yeah. <laughs> it can easily so understand. Have, it is, yeah. yeah, it doesn't have to be like long. It's just that it has to be really informative. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Right. Okay, I'll think yeah. about this. Cool. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, yeah, Travis, sure. did you have uh, another comment to make on that, or? I was done the blog post. I mean, yeah, let's think about it. You know, maybe the Rook blog is the right place, or maybe there's the Seth blog, and then tweet from the Rook account, or whatever. We'll figure it out. That yeah, sounds good. Uh, Travis, did you add this item about uh, support CI. for previous versions in CI of Kubernetes? Yes. Yeah, just something I thought worth mentioning here. Um, so with, you know, there's been discussion really on a GitHub issue that I linked there, uh, 4548 around, you know, sort of longer term support for Kubernetes versions, where, you know, Kubernetes itself upstream is like they only support fixing or patch releases for like the last three versions of Kubernetes, but you know, as people running Kubernetes in production, like they're not upgrading Kubernetes that often, especially with downstream versions of Kubernetes like OpenShift. Um, and also, and even to add to that, Travis, is, uh, like I'm starting to see a problem with that in the greater Kubernetes ecosystem because, like, Amazon's uh, EKS uh, is okay. currently one dot is only supports up to one dot fourteen, at least as of last week. Uh, which is no longer a serviced version of Kubernetes. Of Kubernetes. So it's like, whoa, whoa, right. whoa, this is quickly run into a, like a, a problem, a broad problem now. Exactly. So, so really, if you've got a project that you want to run on Kubernetes, you need to really support to some degree the downstream versions, which are going to have a longer lifetime. So in, I mean, at, at the same time, we can't support them forever from the upstream group project. So um, my thoughts were captured uh, a little in a little longer writing higher in this issue. Um, but in a nutshell, um, my thoughts are that um, in the master branch of Rook, we'll just run the test against the last five versions of Kubernetes and just leave it at that and, and keep it revolving as Kubernetes releases. But in our release branches, um, we can just run the CI against the integration tests against more versions of Kubernetes. So I opened a PR against the 1.2 branch that will get us back to Kubernetes 1.11, which means um, we have six versions of Kubernetes running in one against our 1.2 branch. Um, and then like in 1.3, I think we can continue supporting 1.11 as long as nothing is, is broken. So sort of 1.11 is the stake in the ground now is the minimum version for for a while. Then we'll see how long we can support it. Uh, but ultimately, I can't remember the last time we had any breakage because of something we did in Rook that we didn't know was already limited by a, a Kubernetes version. And we limit Rook to run new features on which versions of Kubernetes, like the CSI driver, like you have to use at least 1.13 to use CSI drivers. We already have code in place that restricts that. So if you're using 1.11, well, you just have to use a flex driver, or, uh, right? So since we already have version checks in place, we can probably support 1.11 for a long time. Um, at the same time, I think it'll be, we'll have to evaluate if something blocking comes up at some point. Yeah, that sounds fairly, fairly reasonable. Uh, 
did have you, like in any of your discussions on that have you gotten much pushback on this idea or like it's everyone's been agreeable to it right uh i don't think there's any pushback the i mean the main concern might be that we you know by running the test against more versions of kubernetes it's just more noise in the ci i mean we should keep fixing the ci and improve that but that's the only downside but, I can see. Yeah, and, but that's in re in releases only, though, right? In the release branches. Yes. Yeah. So it's yeah, which I think that having yeah, uh, I mean, you don't ever really want a high, you know, a a signal to noise ratio that's not you know ideal. But in the release branches is the the time that when you would want the most likely to catch anything possible, you know, as exactly. opposed to a daily master, you're just gonna eh, I can't keep up with that. But in a release branch, like anything that gets flagged or is a potential issue you want to know about. So that's that's reasonable. Great. Um, the the only uh, I guess comment I have that you mentioned uh, uh, CSI is if we do like if we do keep support for 1.13 and up, then we no longer have to maintain the flex driver, uh, which could be like. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how much right. you know effort we're spending on maintaining that uh, and uh, things. Like, I don't, I, I don't know that I really want to argue either way, but that's a consideration. Yeah, that specific question is a good one to have, um, and I think we're still waiting for CSI to get some new features before we even talk about removing flex driver support. Anyway, so, but yeah, that's a specific area that. We'll have to have that discussion at some point. Agreed. Yeah. Our little our little flex driver workhorse. It's been mm -hmm. been putting in the effort for a couple of years now. Bless its heart. Three years, right? Or I think like two, anyway, two more than yeah, two and some, but it's yeah. yeah, it's done its job. It's it's time is now. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I think that sounds reasonable, Travis. Um okay. And there weren't any specific other PRs that got added to the agenda topics. Uh, so I will open the floor. I see a chat coming in. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, from Dimitri. Uh, yeah, so, um, so we were uh, just opening the floor for any other discussion topics. And Dimitri in the chat has mentioned that he has a few slides that he'd be happy to share about EdgeFest. Uh, so, and that's about 10 minutes. So if there's any topics for discussion first, well, we could do those now, and then we could uh, close the meeting out with, uh, with, with Dimitri's. All right, uh, so it doesn't seem like- Yep, yep, it doesn't sound like there's any other topics. So Dimitri, I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, no, not stop recording, keep that going. Uh, this game, oh, there it is, stop share. Cool, okay, Dimitri, you should be able to start sharing your screen now, I think. Okay, let me try. Yes, I, I see your slides here, uh, Dimitri. Okay. Yep. All right. All right. Hi, guys. So just really quick, um, just want to kind of, uh, as we're starting uh, this new year, by the way, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, I wanted to kind of also uh, tell you a little bit more uh, about what's coming uh, to Rook GFS um, and kind of also recap on what, what it is and how it is uh, different, let's say, from CF. Uh, I think it can be complementary as well, as I mentioned multiple times. But um, so what, what's uh, Rook GFS and just as a recap? Um, so GFS um, uh, itself uh, supports uh, by Rook uh, and we provide a variety of functionality if you're well aware, um, we also have built-in GUI uh, with a CRD wizard, means in a GUI you can create CRDs. Um, not necessarily need to plumb them uh, manually. Uh, there is support for embedded environments. It runs, it's, it's implemented in C itself. Um, and the management control plane is implemented in Go. It runs on very uh, small footprint devices like one gigabyte of DRAM. 
two CPU cores, it's always needed. Um, obviously, performance is not going to be great, but it's uh, enough to get uh, kind of remote locations connected. It runs in the clouds on prem and edge frontiers. Uh, it's, it can consume raw disks, directories, key value stores. Uh, the added support was here for uh, Samsung KV SSDs, um, also cloud resources. Um, it is now capable of running on top of um, S3. Uh, if there is an S3 provided, also in MinIO, it can run on top of S3 as well, while uh, keeping the metadata in uh, EBS, for instance, for AWS use, uh, use case. Um, it has built-in scale-out NFS performance uh, optimized NFS protocol, S3 object, S3 scale databases. It's really designed for multi-cloud where and in what sense multi-cloud is. In a sense that it is really a blockchain-like architecture. Um, in a sense uh, where you know about the Merkle root trees, um, everything what's happening to edge of S under the hood uh, creates a new uh, Merkle root. Uh, and based on that Merkle root, which is, can be described as just one uh, SHA-3 signature, which is 64 bytes. So uh, with that, and it's also Git-like, it's very similar to the Git architecture. With that, we essentially providing fault tolerance and, and immutability, and uh, can connect multiple locations uh, very efficiently. This is what the geotransparency is. Uh, it's also uh, geoconsistent, and the way it's done is uh, that because of those Merkle root SHA signatures, they distribute it across different locations. You can now, um, you, you do not need essentially uh, have a snapshot policy. So you, like for instance, a classic uh, CFRBD uh, CSI snapshot, it means this is the delta, you need to send the delta somewhere else. Uh, in case of a GFS, you don't need to send a delta. Uh, so so there, is a, there is a big difference here. Uh, why? Because it's, uh, it's blockchain like, uh, whatever the change is needed can be automatically fetched or pre-cached uh, on a different side. Uh, it, it supports global deduplication, uh, compression on the fly, so between the uh, connected uh, clusters, for instance. Um, it also provides a bunch of uh, um, geolocality functionality, like for instance, if your data set is kind of scattered across different clusters, it can automatically prefetch. All this is done under the hood, so it provides kind of uh, uh, tra great transparency to the application. Um, it is Git-like and blockchain-like architecture. And this is why it's way different from CF in that way. Um, it allows you to build a really decentralized locations. And, like you can run on small devices, it can run on uh, uh, intermediate devices uh, and provide connectivity to the cloud. It can run on top of CF. And this is one of the things we should probably explore uh, to a greater degree this year. So what is coming to 1.3 uh, this year? So we have been working hard on our side uh, and uh, we've not yet entered the Rook um, uh, issues, but we will be shortly within maybe a month's time frame. We are working on these new things. Uh, one is we're adding decentralized scale. Uh, we're gonna call it DSKL, or I know everybody's calling this DSKL, but for the lack of a different word. Um, and the cool thing about this is it's 100% SQLite compatible. So that means it is embeddable, so you can uh, run and access this SQLite compatible interface from a different locations. It can be, for instance, different segments, different clusters. I'll give you an example, it can be from GCP cloud and AWS cloud. You can access the same database and it guarantees uh, right exploration consistency. At the same time, same record, et cetera. Um, it can operate within same segment, can, and as I mentioned, within multiple segments. Multiple segments means multiple clusters. The other feature which we're adding is um, SMB CRDs. So what does it really mean? So currently we do not support SMB, and we've been asked by multiple users of us, ours to add support for SMB. Um, I know that uh, SM Samba supports uh, interface where you can actually extend it. As a matter of fact, Gluster and CF already supports that. But I think uh, in terms of to enable um, a spectrum of the Windows applications, which is a lot, a lot, right? Um, I think it's important for Rook uh, to add support for, uh, for Windows uh, servers as well. 
So by it, by doing that, we essentially completing the storage story as far as the is concerned. Uh, additionally, we adding support for uh, geolocking, which is NFS and SMB geolocking. So what does it really mean? Well, it provides, because now the disk yield is here, uh, it provides us a capability of uh, creating uh, <clears throat> exclusive uh, locking primitives. So why is this important? It's important because some application cannot build up the logic. They need to use something off the shelf so that multiple NFS and SMB locations uh, applications can modify the same file at the same time without worrying about inconsistency. So that, that is why this geolocking is kind of uh, necessary and required. To some degree, you can think about this as a smart contract, uh, like blockchain kind of smart contract functionality to ensure that whatever you modify in that file is consistent across different uh, views. So that's what's coming. And I just wanted to share um, what's, the, what's essentially the use cases. So it's multi-cloud CDN workflow. And um, it can be um, literally used as a CDN replacement. Um, <clears throat> the cool thing about this, you don't need to worry about the consistency. So it, it takes care of the consistency of your uh, CDN content. Cloud availability, so uh, obviously automatic failover can be done and so on. Uh, um, AJT and cloud, this is a big, uh, big thing for us. We are uh, positioning HFS to be um, a de facto um, uh, edge uh, storage uh, uh, engine, so to speak. Uh, we've registered with LFH, we've registered with Eclipse Foundations, uh, with Linux Foundations, and um, we will be making some noise this year uh, in this regard. It's also Kubernetes Pearson volumes across the clouds. So with a um, hook, you can, prom uh, in Edge Affairs, you can get all that functionality out of the box. Yeah, so I just wanted to share this really quick with you guys so that you kind of know now what we're working on this year. Um, so, <laughs> and we're not lost. <laughs> While we are not very active, but we are still working and uh, you should expect more stuff coming out uh, to 1.3. That's awesome, Dimitri. I think that those are some uh, the, some pretty interesting features. Uh, honestly, that, that's that's pretty exciting to hear. Um, yeah, and when you can, you know, getting issues opened and you know, getting like uh, maybe incorporating those into the, the roadmap would be uh, nice to be able to have that uh, like the plan sort of communicated more broadly. But this is a great great uh, first step here. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Jared. Hey, Dimitri, do you have a link to those slides or those uh, like those, like public slides that you can put into the agenda document? Um, uh, I can, yeah, I can probably um, uh, publish them somewhere and you guys uh, and add this to the agenda. Cool, yeah, and if you want, you can just, uh, if it's easier, you can just send it to me in Slack and I'll, I'll, I'll put it into the agenda doc. Cool, we'll do. Cool, thanks Dimitri. Thank you guys. Cool, yeah, it sounds like a lot of new features. I'm curious to look forward to if there's any like sharing we can do with uh, or any functionality we should look at for other providers like Ceph or anyway. Yeah, I was, I was thinking of leveraging existing Ceph installations um, and kind of simplifying deployment of the rook on top of existing Ceph installations. Like for instance, if Ceph provides S3 and block, then we can very easily plumb it on top, right? And then connect different regions. So that sort of use case kind of always kind of boggles my mind. <laughs> like, why yeah. And remind me, does EdgeFS have its own S3 uh, endpoint? It does. It does a bunch of virtualizations, yeah. right? So once it kind of yeah. collects the resources from the existing uh, physical installations, and it does yeah. its own virtualization. So yeah, so there is a layer, obviously, performance impact and so on. But yeah. it is okay. its own virtualization. It's very much like blockchain. Layering, yep. And I guess my next question was if, so we have the object bucket provisioning um, that may you know, maybe be useful for EdgeFS as well to to expose that feature yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I was I was, I probably will add that that one as well. Uh, I think we need to be a consistent what we do with Rook uh, as far as the expo exposing the bucket, right? So we cannot expose bucket three different ways. If it is a Rook operator, yeah. it has to be one way and has to be fairly the same across all the providers, right? Yeah, it sounds good. That's just the one feature area that 
it seems obvious that we can share at least and we'll and we'll grow it over time all right cool sounds great uh, all right, so uh, there weren't any items to add, uh, and then we got to see uh, Dimitri's updates on uh, EdgeFS's planned work items. Uh, so I think that should be everything, all the topics for today. Um, and then we can, so I think we can go ahead and adjourn, and we will meet back in two weeks. All right. All righty, thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Bye -bye. Have a good Bye -bye. day.